culmination of so many things. So that is very exciting. So which I thought, therefore, when he comes as a speaker today, we will really look forward to emotions, corporate management, three-dimensional emotional management, he says, the three DM in his book. So very beautiful uh, talk, at least I'm looking forward to listen to Manjit. So welcome Manjit Singh to Manchester. Mancunians here and Ajay from London also welcome to you. Hi everyone. Um, I think uh, the expectations have been set so high, I'm kind of nervous. And I've already had a glass of wine to calm my nerves down. And then I'm thinking, oh, I forgot the flow I'm meant to be in. Uh, but I think that's what it's about. How do you manage emotions? Um, I won't talk much about the book. Um, uh, there's you know, the three dimensions, I think Rahul has already touched on some other things in the book. It's about what's coming after the book. And this is not about how well the book is selling. This is not about me having written my first book. This is about stories that are coming to me from people who can connect with the book. About business persons, small businesses, big businesses, directors, people who have a normal 9 to 5 job, a project manager, or a business consultant. When they come back to me and tell me, Hey, I read something in the chapter and I could relate to it. A common theme that's coming out, and that's what I'll talk about for the next 10 minutes or so, depending on how the flow goes, is emotions at workplace. I work in a very strange area. I Sometimes I feel very excited about why I do what I do, but then when it comes to how I do it and, and what tools am I using to do it, there's a lot of challenge there. My excitement comes when I look at all the sports world when I look at all the mind coaches who are coaching athletes on how to win a 100 meters race, or who are coaching a team on how to win the next football match, or who are coaching a cricket team on how to win a match, they're also coaching them on how to manage their emotions. Coaching an athlete on what focus do they need to have when they're doing the 100 meters race. And this is not about them saying, forget about your emotions, just focus on the sprint you're trying to do. What they tell them is, if you're feeling angry because you're competing with someone who had beaten you last time, how do you convert that anger into positive energy? Not positive thought, but positive energy to win the competition. Or you could simply be feeling stressed because you tried to break a world record last time, it did not work, and this is now your last opportunity to do it. How do you manage that stress? Or sometimes, and we see that in football quite often where you know, a team has done three goals and we know the game is in the hand, but we don't want the team to get overexcited. A person could be excited that, yes, I've got this game in my hand, and then in the next five minutes, things change. So positive thought, like excitement, can actually work against you. You look at the world of that coaching, where emotions are driving human beings' performance, and a brand like Nike comes up with a tagline saying, just do it. And, and they sell sneakers for sports, and they believe that every human being is an athlete. And just do it is something we all can relate to. Now, this is the exciting part of why I do what I do. You look to the what world, where when you take all these frameworks, and, and with whatever experience I've had in consulting, you offer them to the businesses. The first thing is, just do it, JDI. It becomes JFDI in the corporate world, which is just freaking do it. <laughs> it's not a mind game anymore. It becomes money game. And the focus from a person's mindset a person's body language, a person's way of expressing themselves when doing something, it more becomes about turnover. It more becomes about return on investment. And when you look at a football team, you've got human beings and you have to make sure that they're performing at their peak when they're playing the game. You then look at 12 resources and there's a cost to company there and I need my money back. That's what happens, which is fair enough. Yes, business is all about money. But what I'm trying to get to is there's a layer if you want your employees to really, really perform well, you've got to move outside paying higher pay packages. You've got to move outside offering them free lunches to make them more happy at workplace, or maybe offer them Friday drinks. You've got to move outside that, and you have to teach your team how to really manage your emotions no matter what they are. And I can prove it to you. There are three reasons why we need to tap into emotions of people. The first one is, there's a mantra around. When we have to make people redundant, there's a golden mantra. Hey, listen, it's just business, nothing personal. When 
when we cannot offer a salary increment to the employees or there are no bonuses. The tagline is, it's just business, nothing personal. That's the way the market is right now. For some reason, that mantra has been given to everyone. And the reason why that mantra can't work anymore and we need to move away from saying, it's not just business, it is personal as well. I understand you can't give a salary increment. I understand you can't give more bonuses. I understand you're scared about Brexit, but the way you deal with it with your team You've got to focus on emotions of people. And this is how it works. It's really simple. Any business that's doing business today is all about money. The end game is how do I reach my customer and get them to part with the money? And no matter what you're selling, it could be you know, an accountancy service, it could be insurance, it could be whatever you're selling. The end objective is how do I get the customer to part with money? And we use emotions as a hook point to do that. An insurance company will sell fair to get a person to sign up for an insurance policy. And an accountant could be selling stress. Hey, do you want to go through the stress of this, this, this? Hire me, I'll make things easier for you. A holiday company could be selling happiness. Walt Disney, come there. There's a family that's smiling at you. Big brands that I've worked with, they work in a very really different way. And that they do, they're doing a mix of happiness, excitement, sometimes ego as well. I'm wearing a t-shirt, it's worth 500 pounds, and all it says on that is, I'm not a t-shirt. And that was a bestseller for one of the luxury retailers I've worked for. A simple white t-shirt, it says, I am just a t-shirt, and it was being valued at 500 pounds, and people were buying it. Right? That's being hooked on to emotions. So let's start working backwards now. You've got customers, you've got to hook to the emotions to get the money from them. To do that, you've got a strategy, right? that senior stakeholders, business people come up with. To implement that strategy, you have a team of people. People who are implementing the strategy, they have to do certain tasks to make it happen. When they're doing a specific task, they have to put their mind on it, which means, unfortunately, they have to think when they're trying to do the task. When they're thinking, that will be a direct result of how they're feeling on that specific day. And how they're feeling is all about their emotional state of mind. Somebody could have walked into office at 9 a.m. after having a conflict at their house. Somebody could have some other pressures on, and that's perfectly fine. It's not about creating a culture of happiness. It's about telling the person, I know you're angry. I know you're feeling angry right now. But how do you use that anger to then leverage for whatever you're doing right now, giving that kind of a training to your employees, the training that's given to athletes, the training that's given to army people. So you've got to focus on the emotional state of mind of your employees and you need to teach them how you can leverage on that. That will have a direct impact on your turnover. The turnover of not happiness, the turnover of managing emotions, managing anger at your workplace, managing frustration at your workplace, managing disgust at your workplace, managing ego at your workplace, will have an impact on the turnover of numbers that you have at your workplace. The second reason is we all carry smartphones. And if you tell someone, hey, can you just put your phone on flight mode? And that's really bugging to us. We don't want to do that, right? Because what uses the smartphone then? The smartphone is a hardware. There's a software inside it. If I put it on flight mode, I can't use that software anymore. We human beings, since the day we've been created, since the caveman period, we all have a hardware, which is a physical body. And the software, the apps in our brain, they all work on 9 gig RAM. And every RAM is for one emotion. So pos four positive emotions, four negative emotions. There's one neutral emotion called peace, the one that I talk about in, in, in the book about. All these emotions drive how my mind works. So I've got my physical body. I know my brain is operating on emotions. And the way I'm expressing myself is another talent altogether. So this is the third dimension. How I manage these three dimensions at workplace will decide my performance at workplace. And it doesn't matter who it is. Most of them in this room right now are probably leaders, entrepreneurs who have already been through the journey. So maybe we don't realize that, you know, hey, do I really need to teach them how to manage emotions? Or do I really need to, because some of us have been on the journey by default because of circumstances or whatever. This comes to the third reason why emotions play an important role at workplace. More than half a million of UK working population is under stress or depression. Half a million working population. 
And the top three sectors, right, which contribute to that half a million working population, the first one is education. That's all your teachers and headmasters and everyone else. Second is social services. And the third is defense services. And we hear these stories all the time about soldiers who have come back from wars and, and, then, and then the trauma they go through. If the education sector of an economy is majority of the workers in that are going through stress and depression, just imagine how, what kind of tools or how ready they are to train a future generation on managing their emotions better. Because we all believe emotions are by default. You know, we'll teach our kids maths, we'll teach our kids physics, chemistry, we'll teach them how to code, we'll teach them how to write an app, you know, we'll give them some physical exercise. Emotions, now nah, we just learn it, right? We are human beings. We are not anymore. And technology, the way technology is taking over everything today, we gotta learn how to tap into our emotions. Because more automation technology brings in, the less human we are. There are people today in states where people are opening meditation centers and people are happy to pay money for human connection. This is how technology is taking over everything. So even if you're a small business, you have to be more proactive about making sure that your employees are tapping into their emotions and you're aware about their emotions. How do you do that? And this is the final part, where there are three things I can share. The first one is, it's one thing to be a director or a CEO or have a job title. You also have to become a leader. Now, what kind of a leader do you have to be? Remember the customer thing I spoke about where you have to tap into the emotions of a customer to get money out of them? Exactly in the same way, if you want your employees to perform, you've got to tap into their emotions. And no matter what they are. And that doesn't mean that having more pizza days and having more drinks out and giving free breakfast, free lunches, people don't want that. It makes them happy just for that one small bit. But how do you get them ready no matter what happens, right? You do that by serving them in the same way as you serve customers. So as a leader, don't try to be the dominating person. Just the way a leader behaves like a servant towards a customer, you have to behave like a servant towards the employees as well. Here's an example. When I was working at Amazon for about six months, we get a consulting gig with them. The most important person and this is documented, this is what they tell everyone. Who's the most important person in Amazon? It's not the CEO, it's not the managing director, it's not any other director. The most important person in Amazon is the dispatcher, the final person who's packaging the item that the customer will open. And they state that clearly. That is the most important person. Why? Because that is a final touch point before the package is out of their hands and will go directly to the customer. So here's what they tell to their dispatchers. This is how they look at their dispatchers. All the managers are told, the dispatchers out there, they're like surgeons. So when they're working on a package, they're doing a surgery there. They have got to get it right. And our job as leaders is not to tell them how to pack the item, is not to tell them how to do their job. We just have to make sure they have all the tools they need to be able to do their job efficiently. And that's it. Look at the difference in the attitude. A leader would go, hey, do you have everything you need to do this, right? And the other thing could be, do you need anything else on there? Is a sticker on the right place? Are the boxes in the right place? So this is how you serve them. If you have a team that's all about sales, instead of telling them, this is your target, this is what you have to achieve, just go out and do it, you have to actually probe a little more. If that salesperson is a surgeon, right, and whatever the average value of transaction is, Imagine if every, every client is like doing a surgery, what tools do they need? What list would you come up with? It's in the language. When you start looking at your people as surgeons and I'm just a nurse standing next to that surgeon giving all the tools, you will look at the difference. It makes a massive difference. The second way to do it is, again, as leaders and directors, we, hope we all have been in that edge. You know, we all, we all have like, yes, I've done something, I've created something. You will create a goal that not only scares your team, but it scares the shit out, out of you as well. So, there's a business there. We did five million last year. We're gonna do seven million this year. Why? Because I've got five people there. I'll give these targets to everyone. Boom, my target is achieved. What if you said, you know what? No, my target should be eight million because even I'm scared that target cannot be achieved. And I need to make that happen together with my team. When the team knows, 
that my manager is as scared as I am about achieving the target, you're sharing emotions of, an ang of, of stress there, right? We all are stressed together, so let's just make this happen. That's when teams kick into action rather than just going, oh yeah, he's just sitting there, he's given me the target and that's mm -hmm. it. Create scary targets and lean into the fear with your team. Don't put them into fear. Don't put them into a performance improvement program and leave them on their own saying, out of you five, you're not doing your job, so I'm putting you in a performance improvement program. If you don't perform in the next three weeks, you're out of the door. No, tell them, I'll work with you. Let's set a target that even scares me. And if I can make you achieve the target, then that's a win for me as well. Right? So leaning into fear along with your team. Don't just scare your team on your own. And the third and the final thing, this is more for helping your team not, and, and this is what this is about. When we come to a workplace, we're spending about eight, nine hours every week there. That's a good part of our life. And quite often you hear people go, hey, I need to work on my work-life balance. That's what every employee is trying to achieve, my work-life balance. I come to work to pay my bills. I come to work to save money for the deposit I need for my house. And then I go home and that's when I open up a glass of wine and you know, whatever you have to. You need to shift and understand that, that you don't have to work on your work-life balance, you have to work on your life balance. And what you do every day happens to become a big part of it. How do you take that on board and how do you work with your team on that? Open up conversations around it. When I work with certain big companies, there's, there's a way to manage your team. There's one person who could go, tell me your three projects for the day, make sure they happen and that's it. You know what, I'm paying your salary, you're able to pay the bills, it's perfectly fine. And there's another manager who will actually go out to his team, reach out and he knows everything about his team. A simple exercise I would dare you to do if when you go back to your workplaces tomorrow for those who are managing teams or for those who have businesses, get your team together, give everyone a blank piece of paper and then tell them to write two things. Number one, tell them to write the mission of your business or of your team. What are you trying to achieve in the next year? Number one. Number two, also tell them to write what they want to achieve for themselves in that year. Right? When you get the feedback, the first thing you're checking for is, is everyone aligned on the mission of your business or of your team? That's the first checkpoint to understand how aligned your team is. And the second one is, whatever this comes up of whatever they said, somebody could say, I'm trying to save a deposit for my house. That's my big dream. Somebody else could go, and, and some people do that, is, hey, I want to write a children's book or whatever stuff comes out. Just ask yourself, how much aware were you of that goal? Is when you start having these conversations, we as human beings start connecting with each other. And uh, just on the book bit, it's, uh, it's more like a toolkit. <coughs> and, and as Raul just said, that you know, it talks about the nine emotions, it talks about everything. But the one thing which I truly believe, and this is my end message, is the way technology and the way AI is taking over everything we do, which is genuinely, which will get in jobs because it already is. I come from a retail environment. I work for big retailers. I've seen warehouses with 3,000 people in it. And now I can see a warehouse where there are just robots around it. That's it. There are only 10 people, and the work of 3,000 people is now being done by moving bots around who are just picking the stock and dispatching it. I've also heard about technologies coming out for even a specialized skill like GPs. Right? You go to a GP, you visit them, they do your initial checks, and you know whatever they have to do there. Just imagine wearing a smartwatch, which is tagging you all the time and it goes, your body temperature is high. It just sends a message somewhere on the cloud to Hanitas, and Hanitas send you a paracetamol saying, hey, your temperature has been high for the last days, here's your pill. Or maybe it just notices your blood pressure has been high. All it will do is set up an appointment for you and just send it to you saying, here's your appointment with the consultant. That whole GP job layer could be potentially a threat, right? No one is safe. As technology is taking over, we as human beings have to become more instinctive to survive at the workplace. We're going to be able to do something that machines cannot. And the only difference point would be to dig into our emotions and make access to our current sink more open so that the feedback and the strategies that we come up with, systems cannot replicate it. That's the only USP a human being will have to survive at workplace. When you started, you spoke about emotions and channeling them and attacking them. 
It's good if you're a sports team because you're just going for glory and everybody knows who you are. Working in an office, office environment with your team members or your colleagues or anything, how does one get to the point where your team members are ready for you to channel their emotions into the right way? I'm sure there's got to be some groundwork with trust and transparency and all that. So can you explain a bit more about how does one get to the point where you know your team is going to be ready to listen to you, channeling their emotions in the right way? It's a, as, as much as it's a team effort, which is yes, trust and everything else is important, but when a team is working together, and, and this is where I say the challenge comes in, or the embarrassing part comes in, when me as a coach have to tell, I would like to work one-to-one -one with every of your team member, because here's the thing, as a, as a leader, I might go, how do I make my team more happy? You know, a general decision is yes, we'll go out for drinks every Friday night, we'll do this. You're making the team happy. But every person is on his own at the end of the day. So you gotta take that effort to make sure that every person understands what are their trigger points, what are their negative points. Or for example, a person needs to know when I'm sitting in a meeting, at what point do I start feeling stressed? At what point do I start feeling anger? And when I do, what do I do and how do I? That will come through practice. So you've got to train every person on managing their emotions well, which is where, why when they come back, come as a team together, they'll perform. This is how it's done in army. And I think Simon Sinek gives an example, right? 10 people who are on a mission, they might hate each other personally, but when they're doing that job, they're focused on saving each other first because that's how they've been trained. They have been trained emotionally to work in that way. We really do that at workplace because we just assume that this person has a certification, he can code, he has got the work experience, he'll do the job. Emotions are never even looked at. So you've got to start doing more things proactively when you're training those people instead of just giving them tools to be happy, you're actually having those conversations with them. And, and again, uh, I'm not trying to sell the book, but this is the reason why you know, I wrote this book because it had to be written. This is where you find toolkit where a normal nine to five person can use. You know, they can just open up the book and there'll be a tool in there to understand, you know, I'm feeling angry right now or somebody triggered something in me. How do I do it, right? How do I manage it for myself? So every person takes care of themselves first and only then they can come back as a team together. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Majid, uh, a quick question. When we were chatting earlier before you started, you were talking about an employer sitting in when you're interviewing an employee and you're trying to find out what bugs the employee yeah. about the employer. Now, presumably you've primed them both that they should be frank and open and honest. Have you subsequently had any negative feedback from those people to say, well, actually, it didn't work and it's created chaos amongst the team? So, this comes up quite often and that's another challenge where uh, some people just go, what are the tangible results of, you know, whatever you want to do? I, I love the fact you'll do a workshop every month. I love the fact you'll have one-to-one -one conversation, but how can I measure it? I'm like, you can't. Even I don't know if, if whatever I do is going to work for you because every person is different. My job professionally in that environment where, let's say if there are two employees that have a conflict with each other, is to carefully as a coach manage that environment better. So both persons feel they're in a safe environment. Both people feel they're in a, in a non-judgmental environment. Occasionally, it does happen that I'm working with an employee who's not performing well at the workplace, and sometimes when I'm working one-to-one -one with them, they actually realize this is not what they want to do, and they actually end up leaving the company. But that's for the right reasons, because now they've found something else that they actually want to do. So it, it does happen on rare occasions, but this is where you talk about leaning into your edge, right? How do you, instead of segregating people based on performance, how do you segregate people based on how is this person syncing up with the team together? What is his real personality like? It's like being in a big brother house, or for those who watch Asian channels, it's like being in a big boss house. People will not get along, but the more you have those conversations, the more healthier the environment become, happens at a workplace. So I focus on professionals. One of my coaches, she focuses on, on couples working with, with wife and husbands. And the one thing she says, the main problem between a couple is that they don't talk to each other. And when you help them talk to each other in a controlled environment, which is being, uh, which is being, which is being pretty much managed by the coach, things improve because people go, hey, yeah, I'm feeling better. I've had the conversation. We, we both have had that. So you've got to be open to managing those scenarios. 
at workplace, we just believe, no, 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 that shouldn't be done. I come in, what are your plans for Friday? Yes, yeah, good, come in on Monday, how are you? I'm doing fine. Everyone's doing fine. We live this life, right? We walk into workplace, you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. How was your weekend? Yeah, it was good, thanks. How was your weekend? Yeah, it was good, thanks. Any plans for Friday? Yeah, the usual, usual. Our brain is always listening when we're talking. There's so much monotony at workplace, you've got to break that and you've got to have more conversations and lean into these arguments more because that's where teams will start connecting more with each other because they know it's okay to get angry on this person. And I know that personally, right? Because I apply that in my consulting space. Um, quick example, um, one of the luxury retailers I was working for, uh, it was day two with them and we were meant to do a workshop. That workshop was done twice already and I, I was told that nobody wants to be in that group. You had like four people from IT, four people from business, they were like, we've been trying to do this project for one year now. They've already been here twice doing requirement gathering and you know, what's going to happen? Now, if I was a normal consultant, I would have told people, look, JFDI, just freaking deliver it, right? Let's just get it done. What I did as a coach was I told all of them, right, we're going to spend six hours in this room together. And this is again just a handy tip. I made them aware, I am the facilitator of this workshop. And I'm making it very clear, we all in a safe environment and nobody's judging anyone. So you have 10 minutes to express whatever you want to. If you don't want to be in this room, let me know. We'll have a discussion and we'll take it from there. People came out with their frustrations. We had all those discussions. And then we had an amazing workshop because I took the pressure off, right? I lent into my fear. They could have told me to bugger off day two. This guy doesn't know anything. So this is how you use those tools and you open up those conversations. Yep.